So I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to uh, order. Um, Secretary Steele, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Judge Barker? Mr. DeCosimo? Here. Ms. Desai? Here. Professor Harvey? Here. Ms. Hoffman? Here. Chairman Leroy? Here. And Ms. Worley? We, we have a quorum. Okay. Well, hopefully, uh, if the others are able to join in, uh, they will join us in progress. But uh, let's go ahead and get the meeting going. Uh, and thanks, everyone, wherever you are, um, for taking some time out of your day. This is uh, uh, the, the few meetings we have. This is probably one of the more important ones because we have the budget, review of the budget, and, and potentially approval to pass on to the full board. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and, and move forward. The first item uh, for action, we need to, uh, Teresa had sent out a copy of the February 16th minutes uh, with the, the meeting package. Uh, I hope everybody had a chance to review those. Uh, I didn't see any other things that I needed to uh, make note of or change. Uh, do any of the other members have anything they would like to review or modify. If not, I will ask for a motion and a second. I move the minutes are accepted from the February meeting. I second. Motion to second. Um, David, we'll have to take a roll call vote. Oh. Yeah, I know. Mr. DeCosimo? Yes. Ms. Desai? Yes. Professor Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hoffman? Yes. Chairman Leroy? Yes. The motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one item, uh, only us lawyers in the room really get excited about bylaw revisions. I just, I have to <laughs> be honest about that. Uh, so at this time, uh, Yusuf uh, Ameta is uh, on the Zoom with us this afternoon. The proposed bylaw changes or the amendments uh, for consideration and, and possibly uh, adoption were sent out with the meeting materials and we've had sufficient time you know, to make that official. So uh, Yusuf, I will let you uh, explain to us what's going on. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, I hope that you had a chance to review the summary of the modifications that was included with the actual uh, draft. The main, the change that we are wanting to incorporate here is just to address what happens when there's a vacancy on the board, whether it's a government governor appointed member or a faculty or student member. Currently the, the bylaws are silent on that. And the changes that we are proposing here are um, substantively what's required under the FOCUS Act. The, they do not deviate from the act at all. And um, so for example, the governor under the act is the person who appoints a, a, a member to join if there's a vacancy in the student or faculty ranks. And then the other provisions about what happens for a governor appointed member are all taken directly from the statute. So we are not doing anything beyond the statute. Um, the only other thing that we, uh, I think everybody would probably appreciate is, is we're including a table of contents to help navigate through the bylaws make them easier to use and find information. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any questions. I, the only comment uh, I guess I would make is um, if we had had these bylaw amendments sooner, you know, we've already, we're already dealing with a, a vacancy with Judge Parker, his term expired, uh, and they did not uh, get around to appointing uh, his replacement. So uh, he's continuing to serve. Uh, but now this will give us a process of uh, filling those vacancies uh, when the legislature uh, wasn't able to do it uh, in the normal time frame. So uh, any questions, any further discussion about the proposed bylaw amendments? If not, I'll need a motion and a second to approve. Oh my goodness. I move Red? that the bylaw uh, adjustments be approved. What's the word? Amendments. 
I mean, thank you. Proposed modifications to the bylaws. Okay. And Fran, was that a second? I'll second it. Okay, very good. Um, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Well, we actually have to do the roll call vote again. Sorry Mr. about that. David? Mr. DeCosimo? Ms. Desai? Yes. Professor Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hoffman? Yes. Chairman Leroy? Yes. The motion passes. Very good. Great. Thank you. So at this time, uh, we'll move to some comments, uh, an update from our chancellor, Steve Engel. Steve, I'll let you give your report. You'd think I'd remember to get off of mute, but uh, <laughs> it's not like we haven't done this before. Um, thank you all for being here. Appreciate your time um, and, and what you do for UTC. Uh, April 21st to the 25th, we had uh, nine in-person commencement ceremonies. Each student was uh, able to bring four guests and um, we held them in McKenzie Arena and um, everything went really well. We had 1,838 uh, students who were getting degrees and 1,260 of those participated in the commencement ceremony. So we had pretty good attendance. Um, nine was a lot, but we uh, it was amazing the hard work and dedication of everyone who um, pulled that off. Um, we uh, have a, a very good budget year for higher education with the state fully funding the formula. Um, UTC is uh, going to receive, I think, three deferred maintenance projects in there in the seven to nine million range. Um, Vice Chancellor Forrest will have uh, more information about that. Um, we, we want to thank Governor Lee, um, our General Assembly, and particularly the members of the Hamilton County delegation. Um, you know, we have uh, Chair uh, Bo Watson in the Senate and in the House, uh, Patsy Hazelwood is chair of their respective budget committees. And we really appreciate their commitment to um, the state, but particularly to higher education and uh, the, the budget that was enacted. Um, Vice Chancellor Forrest will have some additional updates around budget um, later on in the meeting. You know, this has been an incredible year and I, I can't thank the UTC faculty, staff and students enough for what they've done to navigate COVID and to really move forward. Um, you know, we increased enrollment slightly. We were up in our contract and grant activity. Um, we've been able to continue and maintain and move forward in spite of COVID. You know, we're doing routine testing. Uh, we're going to continue that. We've been doing contact tracing. We have a vaccine clinic on campus. And we're right now working out what will the details of the fall look like. We're planning a return to normal, uh, return to uh, full density in classrooms. That may mean that students are going to wear masks indoors, which is extremely likely. Um, we're uh, trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible and to be able to know their vaccination status um, as they voluntarily uh, report that. Uh, we're gonna work out details for our fall opening by August 1st and make sure everyone is aware of the, those details so um, we can uh, have a safe return to an in-person fall semester. Um, enrollment is really strong and Dr. Freeman will have an update uh, in a little bit. Uh, we have uh, filled two uh, or filled one major position. Um, Stacy Lightfoot was just announced as our vice chancellor for diversity and engagement, um, and she will begin her position on July 1st. Um, and that was a, a national search with a really strong pool, and um, Stacy just rose to the top uh, of that great pool. Um, 
we will be starting uh, a search for a vice chancellor for development and alumni affairs. Um, interestingly enough, the co-chairs of that search committee are on this call in this meeting, uh, Fred DeCosimo and uh, Yancey Freeman. And we're going to have so much fun. Sorry, Chancellor. <laughs> you sure are. Um, I, I wanna, I'm gonna hold it to that and be glad to answer any questions if people have, but I know there's a big agenda with a, a budget and we may have uh, questions. I wanna thank the advisory board for serving, for your time um, and what you do. And I wanna thank uh, Rachel Worley, um, who's graduating and rotating off the board for the time that she has spent in our next meeting, we'll welcome a, a new student representative. So, uh, and welcome to uh, Mickey Barker. So, thank you. Hey, Judge. So that ends my report. Thank you very okay. much, Mr. Chair. Okay, I think uh, Judge Park Barker is trying to figure out how to become unmuted there. Um, when he does, he, he will join us uh, in voice and in, in image, so. Um, there you go. God, I said, I'm, I'm on now. Somehow I thought it was at 2.30 and I'm a little late getting here, but I'm here. Well, you're here and that's what counts. And we, we are more than <laughs> glad to have you with us this afternoon. Um, you, you missed the, the exciting bylaws uh, uh, amendments and modifications as lawyers. You know, we all just- I think really... I think you have wrote those bylaws for me. The change. Okay. Well, sounds... you did, you did. I'm not, you I'm not did. sure I approve. <laughs> well, you did get honorable mention. Uh, I'll give you that. So thank you. Um, we're to the point uh, in the agenda now. Uh, we have an academic affairs update, uh, Provost Hale. If you could tell us what's going on in the on the academic side of the house, please. Okay. There so, uh, evidently, it's catching in Founders Hall. Um, the uh, forget to unmute yourself part. Uh, <laughs> if you would, uh, please let me know if um, if you can um, see the PowerPoint presentation on the screen. Is it there? Yep. You're you're there now. Okay. Um, and then let's start a slideshow. Uh, don't worry, it's a, it's a very brief one. Um, and the chancellor uh, touched on the content in one of the slides, but I thought I'd give you uh, uh, just a tad more information about the nine commencement ceremonies we had. So you can see in the right column, the number of uh, graduates that we had at each of the ceremonies. You could tell three of them were very small. Um, three of them, uh, actually four of them were, were uh, pretty large. Um, the Friday, Saturday, and uh, the graduate ceremony on uh, Sunday afternoon were um, pretty good size and, and it, it felt much more like a normal commencement for those ceremonies. But the important thing is, um, we got wonderful feedback from graduates and from their families. Uh, we got wonderful feedback from the faculty and staff uh, who helped us uh, stage the ceremonies and who participated in, in any number of ways. And I think what the graduates for the class of 2021 um, have accomplished is especially notable because of um, the incredible persistence and, and flexibility that they showed in the last year. So that's that's a bit more of, of an update or a, a bit more specific information to go along with the, the chancellor's primer related to that information. So uh, spring is nearly over now. Faculty members are uh, feverishly grading and turning in their grades. Um, Vice Chancellor Freeman, don't forget to get your grades in. Um, before the deadline, I turned mine in this morning. And uh, so let's move to fall. 
Um, as the chancellor mentioned, we're planning for a fall semester that looks like a pre-COVID fall semester might have looked. And uh, what I have for you under 2B is the course schedule as of May 5th, so as of yesterday evening. Um, as of yesterday evening, and CRNs are the, are the uh, independent course numbers for each course and section that we are offering. And you can see the distribution across course modalities. Um, the 72% of our courses in the fall are scheduled to be face-to-face. 6% -face. Um, are scheduled to be in some hybrid form, um, some combination of meeting face-to-face -face and meeting online. 22% are scheduled to be exclusively online and uh, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, members of the board, uh, nearly all of those, uh, so the vast majority of them um, will be asynchronous online. They are not synchronous uh, courses for the most part. And then um, there were uh, faculty members for 10 of our uh, course listings um, who are warriors and want to continue trying to offer their courses in the high flex format, which is um, simultaneously online and face to face. And, uh, and so that's um, what the, the course schedule looks like for the fall. If we were to compare that to the fall of 2019, for example, um, what we would have had there is probably around 76% of our courses uh, totally face-to-face, -to -face. the 80% figure that I'm fond of, talk, uh, of, of talking about. I am told that a number of the hybrid uh, courses or all of the hybrid courses would have been included in the face-to-face -face modality. Um, and, and so a more accurate quantity would have been that 76% of our courses in 2019 would have been exclusively face-to-face um, with some uh, hybrid and about 20% of them being exclusively online. Uh, I am pleased with the course distribution that we have for the, for the fall um, because we expected as faculty members became more comfortable with teaching online that the number of online course offerings that we had as a matter of course, as a matter of routine would increase. And in fact, um, I would go so far as to say that's that's preferable. One of, the, one of the things that we would like to do on campus is to increase the number of uh, fully online degree programs, or at least to give students those options so that uh, the accessibility to UTC by students who live outside of the metropolitan area, um, and uh, by that I mean probably um, outside of about a 50 mile radius around the campus, um, can still uh, access a UTC education if they would like to do that. Um, so we're making some progress in that regard, but um, at least you can see that we are predominantly back to a pre-COVID looking schedule um, for the fall. Um, our uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Human Resources uh, has left to the various Vice Chancellors and uh, Division Heads um, the task of devising their own schedules for employees who've been working remotely to return to work on campus. I won't speak for the other vice chancellors who are here in the meeting, but I will tell you that for academic affairs, we expect uh, all of our staff uh, to return um, to face-to-face -to -face work on campus on July 1st, 2021 and for the entire faculty to be available to be back um, by August 2nd of uh, 2021. And, and uh, um, it's August 2nd because the first is a Sunday. So the second is a Monday. And uh, that's um, what that's gonna be looking like. Um, the last thing I wanted to tell you as far as an academic affairs update is to give you an update on our SAC COC reaffirmation process. Um, there are important staffing considerations that I'd like for you to know about. Uh, Teresa Litka, our Dean of the Library, has taken on the additional duty of being our SAC COC coordinator for the campus. And she has done a marvelous job in the first few months of having that appointment. 
Um, the other key person as far as our SAC COC staffing goes is Cindy Williamson, and Cindy is the Director of Assessment and our SAC COC Liaison in the Office of Planning, Evaluation, and Institutional Research. Um, what is, is happening for SACs is our reaffirmation means that we are going to be judged. Um, every aspect of the campus will be judged by our accreditor, and there are 74 separate standards for reaffirmation, including ones related to um, things like the Campus Advisory Board and how we interact with the system and the Board of Trustees, for example. Um, the most important thing that we have to do in the short run with regard to the SAC COC reaffirmation is, has to do with our Quality Enhancement Plan. The Quality Enhancement Plan, or QEP, is Standard 7B in the 74 uh, standards that SAC COC has. Um, there are three things that it must do. Uh, it must be aimed at improving student learning outcomes in some way. Uh, it must come along with a resource commitment by the university, and that resource commitment is a commitment that has to sustain whatever the QEP is for the 10-year cycle for this reaffirmation, and it has to include a plan for how to assess our, our progress to know whether we are succeeding or failing. And what has happened so far is we have held a number of uh, what Dean Litka would call QEP roadshows, uh, 10 input sessions where the attendees uh, to date have included um, faculty, staff, and students. And uh, with, a, with a handful of, of uh, members of the community of our various advisory boards participating as well, um, they are currently compiling the input from that. Uh, and they've also administered a survey related to the QEP. The QEP topics that we have been considering uh, to date, uh, one has to do with uh, improving diversity and inclusion on campus. A second has to do with uh, cohort-based learning experiences, which uh, we know um, from some data from other universities greatly enhance um, student success metrics on, on university campuses. And the third has to do with experiential learning and high impact um, educational practices, learning beyond the classroom. And so we are soliciting input to uh, so that the executive leadership team then um, can make a choice uh, and chart a course for us for the next 10 years. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's the academic affairs report. Are there questions that I can answer? Uh. Thank you, Jerry. The only question I was you know, when you were talking about the number of face to face and hybrid and flex classes, how does that do, do we have any gauge on how that compares to other universities or peer institutes? Are they is everybody pretty much on that, that same program, you believe, or I, uh, have, have we made an, any assessment of that? Precisely how it, it compares, Mr. Chairman, I can't tell you. What I can tell you is that. Um, all of our peer and aspirant institutions, to the best of my knowledge, and uh, I have contact with uh, all of the, the provosts um, for the Southern Conference schools and uh, from a number of our um, aspirant institutions. Um, they are, uh, for the most part, uh, all planning on uh, being back in a, a pre-COVID-like um, schedule for the fall. Okay. Um, one thing where there is some difference uh, is there are now about a little over 200 universities, the most recent report that I saw, um, that are requiring students to be vaccinated before they come back to campus. Um, and that would be the only difference between um, some of those uh, schools and us. Um, but uh, other than that, the, the scheduling um, everybody is uh, scheduling to be open in fall in a pre-COVID-19 uh, like fashion. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Any other questions on the academic update for our provost before we move on? All right. Well, uh, Dr. Hill, you also have the next uh, slot here with a strategic plan. Uh, update and and let me say before Jerry gets started, uh, Fred DeCosimo and I have, have been participating in 
some of the subcommittees. And I will just tell you, I am very impressed with the level of engagement, enthusiasm, and work uh, of the other members of the committee. I mean, they really have been, been putting in a tremendous amount of time and effort uh, toward uh, pushing you know, the 2025 plan forward. Uh, it didn't happen on the, the, the you know, uh, timeline that was initially laid out, but I think in this you know, COVID and hopefully post-COVID environment, things will catch up. So uh, keep up the good work. And uh, Jerry, if you'll give us an update, we'll uh, hear the rest of the story. And part of where I was going to begin was to, uh, to tell you and uh, Mr. DeCosmo, thank you for your participation. The participation by the entire uh, campus community has been outstanding. And all the folks who have worked on work groups and our integration committee, which is the group again that took um, the various uh, subcommittee or work group reports and, and put them together in something that looks much more like a cohesive document. Uh, it, is, it is the case that uh, I, I also need to give a lot of the credit for the progress that we've made to uh, our chief of staff, David Steele, uh, to uh, Tom Griscom, and also to Alexis Hurley, um, who've been doing a lot of the uh, a lot of the heavy lifting and uh, on the uh, construction of where we've been so far. Um, this will be considerably shorter than the last report. Um, if you look at the strategic. Uh, uh, plan uh, draft or allow me to tell you a little bit about it. Um, we are now uh, back to the future. You'll remember when I reported to you in February, um, I, I told you that it appeared as though we were being asked to make sure that uh, UTC's strategic plan uh, mirrored very closely the strategic plan that the system was putting together. I think in part because of, of really uh, excellent Swaysery communication by Chancellor Engel um, that uh, uh, President Boyd uh, rethought that and uh, believed that uh, the campuses that were uh, redoing their strategic plans should have unique strategic plans, but that we should be able to tell people how they dovetailed nicely with, with the system strategic plan. And so we'll be able to do that. What that means for us is that we are back to the four goal structure that we originally began with, with one goal related to, to teaching and learning, one related to diversity and inclusion, one related to research and innovation, and one related to stewardship and resources. And uh, what I've put as bullet points there for you to look at are, are just a couple of the things that are gonna be highlighted, I think, in each of those areas based on the work that the work groups and the integration committee have done so far. Provost, we are not seeing your slides. Oh, well, um, that won't hardly work then, will it? Uh, let's try that one. That's good. OK. David, thank you. Um, how many college degrees does it take to share your screen? Um, so, um, underneath the teaching and learning uh, goal, um, two of the highlights that I would pass along to you are uh, that we want to very much uh, undertake some initiatives that will increase student access to, UC, to UTC and student achievement. And we also want to have a distinct model of educational excellence. And that distinct model of educational excellence will include things like uh, at least the skeleton of what will be a, a new uh, set of uh, general education requirements we are hoping, and um, one that is much more um, skill-based. So the general education uh, committee that is working on campus right now under the able direction of Dr. Lauren Ingram is asking slightly different questions than how many credit hours in the natural sciences, how many credit hours in the humanities, how many credit hours in the social sciences, and they are asking questions like, what essential skill sets do we want graduates to have when they finish up at UTC? And they are uh, working to craft a general education model for us um, that will answer uh, questions of that sort. 
Um, the other thing that will be part of that distinct model of educational excellence is, I think, a commitment on the part of the entire university to more cohort-based experiences. And uh, again, we know that the cohort-based experiences help students connect to the campus uh, more quickly and readily. Um, they help with student retention and um, they also help move the needle in significant ways on uh, four and six year graduation rates. And so those are a couple of the initiatives that are there. Um, in terms of diversity and inclusion, um, that we're really thinking of diversity and inclusion quite broadly to include expanding student access uh, to technology. We still have a large quantity of our students, especially those from more rural parts of the state um, that have a technology gap between what we would like for them to have um, to be completely active members of our campus and what is available to them. Uh, we want to expand access to the university for students from underrepresented groups and or groups with special needs. Um, and so that includes uh, both racial and ethnic uh, minorities, it includes first generation students, it includes students from low income families, but you'll see uh, under the special needs category, we're working very closely and getting a lot of input from Michelle Rigler so that we can make the university more accessible to uh, students um, with uh, various sorts of disabilities as well. Um, and then finally, we want to make a, a commitment to expand our online degree programs. The, one of the fastest growing demographics for uh, college uh, students is not just non-traditional students in terms of age, but also students who are, uh, have some college credits earned, but no degree earned, who, ste who stepped away for a while. And we want to try to find ways to bring them back. And so the best way for us to do that is to expand online degree programs because most of those students are also working somewhere between 40 and 60 hours a week and they can't come on Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 o'clock, um, but uh, they still can uh, change their lives in positive and significant ways if we can bring them back on degree programs that they can access. Under research and innovation, we want to increase um, resources and support for research and also increase our research productivity. And we've made a commitment to try to identify up to three areas of strategic opportunity where we might be able to invest resources and uh, um, have an extremely positive benefit to the, to the region and to the state. Uh, under the stewardship category, you'll notice um, uh, quite a bit of, of what is there. Um, still aims at uh, improving uh, services uh, for students and the environment on campus for students. So we want to try to expand our student support services. We want to benchmark and expand our health and wellness resources for students. And we also want to adapt financial aid models so that they will increase access for uh, more students to be able to um, have the benefits of a UTC education. Um, the, uh, the timeline, this is the abridged timeline. I think the actual timeline either has been emailed to you or will be uh, shortly, but you'll see that the target date for finishing up has changed. Uh, in part, that was because President Boyd um, asked the campuses who were revisiting their strategic plans if they would um, wait and uh, present their strategic plans to the Board of Trustees at the same time, the system was going to be uh, doing the same thing, and that's at the October Board of Trustees meetings. You'll see on the slide also some uh, key dates, um, dates when we expect to have uh, updated drafts of the strategic plan available um, for the campus and community to view. Um, you'll see a schedule for alumni and community stakeholder meetings beginning um, the week of May 17th. And uh, the week of May 24th, uh, the first of those weeks being for community stakeholders, and the second of those weeks being for alumni uh, stakeholders. Um, and then campus sessions, the week of August 10th. And the campus sessions are being pushed back because so many of our uh, faculty are on nine month, uh, nine -month 
uh, contracts and will not be around during the summer. Um, you'll see under uh, uh, 2C, um, with regard to summer feedback portals, just because faculty members are going to be gone doesn't mean they can't review the updated drafts of the strategic, the strategic plan and provide us feedback. We are going to have feedback portals available for people who want to leave us notes or suggestions or constructive feedback for all four of the, uh, uh, of the goal areas. And then finally, what you'll see there is you'll see culminating meetings uh, we have uh, tentatively scheduled for the chancellor to brief President Boyd the week of September 20th, a presentation to you all uh, the week of uh, October 4th tentatively, and then um, our presentation again to the Board of Trustees uh, the 21st and 22nd sometime during that two day uh, time period um, and uh, for the, the Board of Trustees to uh, offer their hopefully their final blessing to our strategic plan. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think that's all I have. Yes, it is. Are there questions that I might answer? Uh, Jerry, this, this is Mickey Barker. Uh, David Steele sent us an unabridged timeline this morning and I appreciate that, but you, I think you first read off or showed us the, the strategic draft plan. Do we have a copy of that? Have you sent that out to us? The one, the one you first read off earlier. Uh, Justice Parker, that has not been uh, sent yet, and, and the reason is because um, there are still a number of holes in it, and so we know, for example, that we want to um, increase access to certain programs, and we've asked vice chancellors um, to help us uh, construct um, both what are reasonable, but at the same time, goals that are going to stretch us a little bit, and so That's fine. I just want to make sure I'm I just want to make sure I hadn't missed anything. That's fine. No, sir, you haven't missed a thing. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so uh, as soon as a few of the potholes have been filled in, uh, we'll be pushing that out to you all. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I'm happy to provide the update. I think you're on mute, Scott. You're right, that uh, it's catching. Um, it's catching us all, so I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Provost Tell, uh, for that update. Uh, next on the agenda, um, looks like we have an en enrollment update from uh, Vice Chancellor Yancey Freeman. Yancey. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Leroy. I will, let me share real quick and get going. I hope everybody can kind of see my screen and see what's there. Can you see the PowerPoint? Okay, as yes. long as I did it better than the provost, I'm, I'm in good shape, so. I'm, there you okay. go. Yes, okay. you, need to, you need to give me a tutorial. <laughs> Well, I am really excited about having an opportunity to update you on enrollment management and student affairs, and I'll try to make this uh, as quick and, and as painless as possible. I wanted to start with just a close out of the spring semester to give you some idea of where we were. Uh, some of you may have seen the news story yesterday on uh, WRCB. In fact, it was this morning uh, about enrollment in uh, community colleges and four-year institutions in Tennessee. And I spent about 30 minutes talking to the reporter yesterday, but didn't get much press because UTC did not lose enrollment in the fall or the spring. Uh, we were up uh, more in the fall and just up slightly in the spring. And so you can see the numbers compared to where we were. Uh, graduate school has been like gangbusters uh, gaining speed. And so uh, you'll see kind of where that spring headcount was at the 14th day. That is the official uh, day for us in terms of, of uh, overall numbers. I want to also give you a look at the, the housing numbers for the spring. I have current occupancy, but we are officially out of the spring semester. So I should just put spring 21 on, on that slide. You'll see for spring 21, we had 85% occupancy for Barresco South and 70% for North Campus, which gave us about a 78% overall spring occupancy rate. 
Uh, I am very, very pleased uh, with where we were with housing. Most of you are keenly aware of the fact that we have gone through a pandemic and for parents and students to trust us enough to be away from their safe haven of being at home and to come and live on campus and entrust us with that care over the two semesters. I am uh, in awe and in gratitude of, of them allowing us to do that. And so we'll certainly take this and hope to be, uh, well, we're anticipating being full again in the fall. So we'll talk about that in a second. I, I wanna squeeze in just a uh, prompt because a lot of my days are spent right now talking about cohort 2025. Uh, the chancellor during the State of the University address this past fall uh, suggested that there might be a chance for us to give every freshman student a cohort-like experience. And so we set out from that moment, even prior to that moment, when he came to me with a great deal uh, to say, this is what I'd like for you to do. Uh, we've set out from that moment up until today, and we'll continue until the fall with setting up a cohort experience for all of our first-time freshman students is categorized into three areas. One is residential, and we'll talk some about the stuff that we do with residential uh, in living learning communities, in themed learning communities. Uh, we have faculty and residents. Uh, we have uh, residential colleges in our residence hall. So never before have I seen UTC dive into sort of this area. The second piece of this is in connections, and it is for those high profile student organizations that are out there, things like Freshman Senate, ROTC, uh, a student, student athletics, the band, uh, those things that are very high profile are gonna be part of the connections piece. And the final piece of this, and the one I am most excited about is the academic piece, because it pairs students with uh, two or three classes in some situations, it pairs them in courses together and by discipline and gives them an opportunity to begin forming a community at a new institution and they can acclimate to the campus. And so there are three parts to this. Uh, overall, I am thrilled about this. We hope that we'll get all 2,300 new freshman students uh, this fall engaged in a cohort experience so that they can uh, acclimate to our campus and we can get back on the student engagement side of what we had to do on uh, how we had to pull back some this past year. This is where we are uh, as of May the 3rd uh, in terms of an enrollment number. So it gives you a really good idea. Uh, this is a chart that I give to uh, several of my colleagues, to the chancellor as well. Uh, to keep up with where we are. You'll see we, we are uh, faring very well so far in terms of overall numbers. We are up 279 in headcount compared to last year, day-to-day headcount uh, compared to last year, and up 129, almost 130 uh, in FTE. So that number is really strong, really promising. We're up on a year that we were up from last fall. And so this is really good news as we continue to go. Uh, this is going to continue to change because we do pre-registration for all of our new freshmen. So we're going to be registering new freshmen and new transfers. So we're probably going to be registering somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 students in May. Uh, and so we'll see this kind of explode because our new students have not registered yet. This is an indication of our returning students and also of the retention rate for the campus. So very pleased here. This gives us some idea about where we are right now with housing. We just started assigning our first year, our freshman students. Uh, so North Campus is now at 65% uh, as of May 5th. South Campus is at 84%. I anticipate that we're going to be at 95% overall for the campus because we are uh, with like trailblazers. I had two parents email me last night uh, new freshman parents emailing, asking about room space and that kind of thing. So we are uh, continuing to change this number as well, but very good trajectory that this is on in terms of, of housing for this upcoming fall term. We will uh, have some isolation quarantine rooms in the fall. Uh, we had 279 uh, spaces this past year. We are reducing it to uh, less than a third of that for this upcoming year. So we'll have some spaces in South Campus, 
uh, and also some spaces in North Campus as well. Uh, we hope we have zero cases of students who contract COVID in the fall. But in the event that we do, we do want to assure that we can accommodate them um, from a health perspective, also from a mental health perspective. Our a counseling center has been engaged with students who have been uh, quarantined throughout the year. And so uh, we will have those rooms ready and available for students in the fall and, uh, and hope we don't have to use them. Uh, and because I'm a big old kid and I think a picture is worth a thousand words, the rest of this is really in pictures. Uh, it, it is about what we did through student life uh, and, and in particular, how we did it through a COVID environment where you had to social distance. And so now you see on the screen, uh, socially distanced Olympics. And so you see them playing ping pong and there were lots of games where uh, we took opportunities to engage them, but uh, they weren't in uh, close proximity as you might see in, in a lot of, of a previous years. So there is that. Um, we always entice them with food and t-shirts. And so uh, you'll see lots of, of uh, prizes and giveaways, that kind of thing, small group things uh, for them to be able to do. Uh, painting was very, very popular. We had some grab and go things where students would pick up a set of paint or a board and take it back to their room uh, and paint, or we would do it in a really big room, or we'd get out on Chamberlain Field and do something. So painting was really big this past year. Uh, we had a drive-in movie. Uh, now this is going to take some of you back uh, if you start thinking about drive-in movies. We had a drive-in movie uh, opportunity for students in the spring where they were able to drive their car and we set up a really big board uh, down on South Campus and let students park in the lot and enjoy uh, Disney Soul, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, here is a, sort of the check-in for that, where we were also giving prize and prizes and popcorns and popcorn and uh, Jolly Ranchers and all sorts of stuff for them, uh, you know, to engage. You've seen this one with movie night. We did it on Chamberlain Field uh, with the circles drawn, more uh, painting parties. We did this one with our first generation uh, students. And so chances for them to get together and engage uh, in opportunities. Every time you see me, I'm going to say goat yoga. So uh, because I am often amazed at how well and how much our students love uh, goat yoga, you would not believe. Um, and so we did uh, lots of goat yoga this past year for students to be able to engage for mental health. We used the, uh, the docks down on the Tennessee River for paddle boarding uh, for students who would venture into doing it. Uh, there were lots of opportunities for them to do so there. Uh, lots of stuff on Chamberlain Field, uh, ultimate Frisbee competition. So lots of stuff for them to do uh, there as well. Uh, I told you we love sweets and swag. And so lots of UTC stuff and opportunities to educate students and give them free stuff. So as many times as we could uh, give them something, it usually would get them out. And so we got a little line working there uh, of, of uh, chances for students to get stuff and that's actually it. I, I will stop. I, I wanted to make that very quick and, and full of pictures. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that folks might have uh, for me. Yeah, Yancy. Yes, sir. It's me again. It's me again. Hey, Judge. I, I don't know whether this is politically correct or, or possible or legally possible, but you know, when I went into the army the first day, I had eight shots. I didn't have any say so about it. Plague, yes, yellow fever, everything. Uh, is there any is there any possibility that all the boarding students who are on campus be required to have be fully vaccinated before school starts in the fall? Is that possible or practical or, or correct? Uh, so uh, our general counsel has already warned me that if I try to roll up anybody's sleeve to give them a vaccination, that I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. So I see I see he has unmuted. I will let him respond to that question. Yusuf wants to steal. Uh, Judge Bark, we don't have any legal authority to require any students to get vaccinated, and there will be no legal authority um, this year for certain. So the answer is no, we cannot. Does the campus even have any vaccination program? So if students want to be vaccinated, they do it on yes. campus? I, yes, I should have I'll let, mentioned I'll let Yancey oh, talk about that. Yeah, I should have mentioned that uh, we have a phenomenal uh, health affairs team led by Dr. Chris Smith. 
Uh, they've done a great job with not just routine testing because we've offered routine testing for students uh, for the entire year and the process has been very seamless, but we are a vaccination site. And so we have been vaccinating uh, students, faculty and staff at UTC, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's been since the beginning of March, maybe the, the middle of February, we've been doing vaccinations. Uh, we've opened it up now to folks who are connected to UTC. So if my wife or daughter or someone that is connected to my family wants to get vaccinated, they can do so. It is very, very simple. It is very, very easy. Uh, they have a mobile show that is getting ready to go on the road as well. So they will even come to your office in some ways if you want to be vaccinated. So yes, we do uh, have a vaccination process in place. Uh, we are recording it and working with the Hamilton County Health Department to record that information as well so that we are reporting uh, which uh, folks at UTC have been vaccinated. Okay. Yes. 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 Have you all considered incentives? You know, you were talking about stuff. I know states are about some incentives for increasing vaccination. Yes, we have. I'm, I'm happy you mentioned that, and I should have mentioned it in my presentation. We have been doing incentives. We had incentives this past year for routine testing, uh, and they were really nice things. Uh, Vice Chancellor Forrest gave us the permission to do a PS5 and some AirPods uh, for students as drawings. We gave um, $5 uh, gift certificates to Starbucks and Chick-fil-A. Uh, they loved Starbucks and Chick-fil-A. And so they, we were giving gift certificates there for folks who had come in. We're doing the same thing for the vaccination, um, but we are asking students to upload their information into Medicat, which is our software package uh, used by University Health. For folks who upload their information, they're going to qualify. Uh, we are trying to stay far away from uh, breaking any sort of Tennessee statute around requiring a vaccination and or putting a student in a situation where they feel like there's pressure coming from the university. So we are using the incentives to, uh, to try to encourage them to upload information if they have been vaccinated. Uh, you should also know that Vice Chancellor Heddleston, George Heddleston is also helping us with the marketing uh, to faculty, staff and students to encourage them to be vaccinated. Some of this is about education. And so for us, the more we can educate our um, our community, our, you know, our campus population, we're hoping it will continue to help drive up those vaccination rates for campus. What, well, what, what, oh, this is Serena, sorry. Um, what vaccinations are we offering the students? Is it the double dose vaccine or the Johnson Johnson single dose? And how are we uh, kind of following up with the second dose vaccine for those students if that's so required? We have been doing uh, both. Uh, both the uh, double dose of Moderna and also the single dose of Johnson & Johnson. We took a break, of course, when uh, there was a, a respite on the uh, Johnson & Johnson one, and now it is back. And so we have been uh, doing the, you know, both vaccines. Um, we have also been talking with students. Uh, to be completely honest, I, I've encouraged as much as I can to get our students to do the at least the one vaccine dose uh, with Johnson & Johnson. Uh, with our population, it is more difficult to get them to come back uh, for a second dose. And so having them get at least some vaccination in was most important to us. But for those who wanted uh, you know, to do the Moderna, they could do that uh, and then get the second dose. We have been sending them notices uh, because there is an interval time that you, you, know, you take the first one and then it's 21 days or 28 days until the next one. And so they've been communicating with those students. We have told them that they don't have to get the second dose from us. So a lot of them who recently got the first dose will probably get their second dose in their own community. If it's not uh, Hamilton County, they'll get it in their own community. And so we've shared with them that they can certainly do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Freeman. Uh, great report, and it does look like uh, the numbers are moving up in, in the right categories, uh, student population and less than COVID, so I love it. Um, next on our agenda, uh, Vice Chancellor Tyler Forrest is gonna give us a financial report, and then we'll, uh, after that, talk about the budget. 
So Tyler, lead it away. Well, good afternoon uh, to each of you all. I want to go ahead and share in advance uh, to not be scared by the slide deck. Uh, there's more slides than normal, but I, I promise you I'll either go quick or skip some of them. But we wanted to give you all as much information as possible going into this meeting, especially since you would be adopting our budget, uh, proposed budget. <clears throat> Can you see the slideshow? Yes. <clears throat> okay, great. And I also open my presentation by saying this, this certainly is a team effort. Although I'm the one presenting it, there's a lot of folks on this call that played a significant role in this process, as well as a lot of team members across the campus that did as well. We, we included this beautiful picture at the beginning because I think that sets the tone of our campus as, a, as an arboretum here right in the middle of our city. So we always like to highlight that as well. One thing that, that we are frequently asked about and you all have asked about in the past is what is our current financial position? And when I shared this uh, with you in February, uh, the balance at the bottom uh, was higher than 24 million. It was in the 30 plus million range. Uh, we're currently still trending uh, well ahead of, of expectations this year. Uh, we have uh, revenue uh, yet to be realized in state appropriations as well as summer tuition and fees. So we also have some expenses yet to be realized as well, uh, both on the operating and several payrolls left as well. I do anticipate uh, we will have a strong surplus balance, uh, particularly as we transfer in a good bit of lost revenue from three rounds of HERF funding that we can charge lost revenue to. And I'll explain that to you a little bit more in, in the upcoming slides. If you look at our reserves, uh, they still remain strong as well. Um, unobligated, we're sitting right at about $33 million. That top reserve category labeled campus reserves, I do anticipate that growing going into the fiscal, going into the end of the fiscal year, as well as our fund balance, which is that bottom uh, campus reserve there, currently sitting at $9 million. I do hope that uh, increases to over 10 million, uh, given we are preparing for a SACS reaccreditation in the next couple of years. We're continuing to try to grow that fund balance, which is one of their primary indicators on their assessments. Next on the, the uh, slide deck is an outline of the budget planning overview and sort of the process uh, we undertook. If you look here on your, your screen right now, you'll see some things that are general financial variables that we considered this year and in the out year as well. The first being tuition and fee recommendations. As, as THEC continues to have a pretty substantial hand in setting binding tuition rates, th this is becoming a little bit more and more of a challenge, less so on the general tuition side, more so on the mandatory fee side as we try to move forward several large capital projects. State appropriation continues to be strong and something that we're very thankful for. The chancellor already acknowledged that, and I can only second that for sure. Enrollment, uh, one of our biggest variables because it drives our, our largest revenue stream of tuition and fees. As you've heard from Dr. Freeman, it is trending up and remaining strong. At, at very worst, we hope it will remain flat, and if so, our budget will hold as planned. Stimulus funding is something that we have been very fortunate to receive throughout this year. I will be the first to admit to you all though that it does have some challenges in spending it. And uh, we, we've been successful at that so far, but with the HERF 3 in particular, I think we'll continue to face some, some uphill challenges to get all of those dollars spent, but we will do our absolute very best to do so. We'll continue to focus on the pandemic response and all of the expenses associated with that as well as housing occupancy. This year, you know it was down. Uh, thanks to that HERF funding, I think we'll close the gap largely on that, but it will be something we continue to monitor, as well as long-term debt. We have several projects in the pipeline, uh, specifically a university center renovation, uh, new housing uh, complex in the next few years, as well as the McKinsey Arena addition. Uh, All of those will add debt to our balance sheet, so that's something we're closely monitoring and watching. Athletics struggled this year from a revenue standpoint, but I will tell you that AD Mark Wharton and his team have done a phenomenal job at still trying to, to balance their budget this year, and I, I commend them for that. 
And one thing we have on the horizon that I don't think we have shared with you all before is the University of Tennessee is moving forward with an RFP to uh, have a new ERP system. Our current system is right at about 20 years old. It is not, it does not do what we need it to do uh, here in the, in 2021. So by 2024, we will have rolled out a new ERP system and we're all excited about that, even though I know it will have some pain points along the way to get it implemented. And looking at what is our, what is our financial or financial response been to the pandemic, we have issued everything from student refunds to block grants to student emergency fund investments, as well as really focused on maintaining positive financial health throughout the the entire pandemic. And I'm proud to report to you that we really are in a good financial position coming out of it. Uh, future actions will obviously be continuously assessing that financial position and slowly loosening what has been a selective hiring freeze. As long as enrollment holds, I expect that hiring freeze or again, selective hiring freeze would be uh, lifted completely by the fall semester. And then we will continue to focus uh, diligently on successfully distributing all of the HERF 1, 2, and 3 funds. So looking into HERF 1 a little bit more, at this point, all of those funds have been either spent or obligated. Most notably out of that, uh, we awarded 4,843 student block grants or uh, emergency fund payments. I think both of those programs were extremely successful. We've also prorated over $2 million of refunds to auxiliary units that issued student refunds last spring, and we will do a few, some more of those uh, prior to the close of the fiscal year. And then we also bought everything you might imagine related to PPE and technology. HERF 2, uh, which was the like obviously the second round of um, federal stimulus funding, known most commonly as CRISA funds. The acronyms keep changing each time. And so far from that, we've distributed over 5,200 block grants and emergency funds. And we added an additional a million dollars uh, to the student emergency fund as well. So those, both of those programs are continuing to be successful and working as planned. Uh, we've also continued to spend dollars on PPE as well as a great deal of resources on COVID testing, and we will realize some lost revenue going into this into this fiscal year, hopefully in athletics, auxiliaries, events, and other programs. And finally, HERF 3, uh, we've received a preliminary notification, but not an award yet on it, but that is expected to be right at $26 million. Uh, half of that is required to go to students, uh, which will also be paid in the form of those same block grants as well as student emergency funds. And then the remaining 13 million will be retained by the campus for institutional expenses that, that will largely piggyback on everything I've already explained so far. Our timeline for this year has been very similar to years past. We've continued to engage the campus at all levels uh, since last October in planning for our budget. Last week, uh, the chancellor and I hosted a budget town hall with almost 200 campus attendees uh, showing up virtually to learn about our proposed budget. And then today is the, obviously the advisory board here on May 6th. And then assuming you all approve our proposed budget, the UT Board of Trustees would consider it for approval on June 25th. So we are getting close to wrapping up this process. Looking at tuition and fees, I, I will tell you that the chancellor, myself, and a number of others really considered diligently, should we increase tuition and fees this year? And we do feel like we're in a good position for a modest increase, particularly given we did not have an increase last year at all, and even a modest increase the year before that as well. Uh, we're also well positioned from a market standpoint. You'll see here, we continue to remain middle of the pack with all of our in-state peers and often closest competitors. Uh, right now we're at $9,656. If all of those are inflated by 2%, we would stay about the same place. We know UTK is not having a tuition increase because of a substantial enrollment increase that they had in lieu of, an, in lieu of a tuition increase. 
but I can tell you they will comfortably remain at the most expensive spot in the state. As far as where will those tuition and fees land, uh, once the 2% increase is implemented and assuming it is adopted, uh, we'll be at about $9,848 for an in-state undergraduate student, bordering state and out of state uh, would go up accordingly. And all of these numbers are reported based on a 15 hour scale, if you were wondering that. Also out of state remains competitive as well, particularly, uh, excuse me, not out of state, graduate um, in-state remains competitive as well at about 10,474. That would be increased by 2%. Uh, the out-of-state rate itself, uh, you'll notice here of 8,064 and 16,064 respectively will not be going up, which is why the out-of-state and international percentage increases are less than 2%. As far as what will be changed, uh, the exact dollar amounts, uh, you'll see those on your screen per fee. Uh, this is something that you all are, are asked again to adopt in the proposed budget. Everything is set at a 2% increase with the exception of the auxiliary units. Uh, the auxiliary units are required to pay for 100% of the 4% salary pool, which is why we're moving forward with 3% increases in residence halls, meal plans, and parking. And I will note here that the debt service increase, which is the only mandatory fee increase there on the third line down, will all be designated to a future university center renovation. Here again, you'll see that the debt service of the mandatories is the only one going up. That's a 12% increase on that fee, but aggregately, is 2% overall. As far as how will we spend this new revenue inclusive of what we'll get from the state, here you'll see the, the revenue summary on the slide deck in front of you. Uh, tuition uh, will bring in right at about $3.9 million. That includes the third year phase in of the SOAR and four funds, which was the transition uh, to the 15 and four program. State appropriations will bring in about $4.4 million. Uh, the remaining of those are, are all less significant than the top two, but I will point out a uh, reserve transfer of a million and a half. Uh, that's an incoming transfer. Last year, that figure was at $5 million as we planned for the pandemic. So we've drastically reduced our non-recurring transfer in for a total new revenue of right at about $13.1 million or I should say reallocated revenue in some regard. Where will that be spent? Uh, here's a summary. If you want the details behind any of this, I will certainly be more than happy to share it with you, but I'll point out three numbers on this slide. Uh, academic affairs, as always appropriately so, receives the lion's share of the distributions each year, set at about $2.7 million. Much of that is for lectures and bottleneck courses and other faculty members or faculty agreements that were set in order uh, to uh, move forward certain high performing programs. I'll also note on the institutional line, you'll see a $4.7 million uh, increase there. The vast majority of that is related to the 4% salary pool proposed by the governor and subsequently adopted by the General Assembly. Uh, one thing that many of you all know, but uh, some others don't, is although the state uh, takes credit for 100% of the salary pool, because UTC is a formula unit, they only fund 55% of it. So that is another reason that tuition would be going up slightly in order to pay for the remaining 1.5% of that salary pool. And then something that we brought to your attention earlier this year that we've worked very diligently on is how do we go about closing a $4 million scholarship gap, which has been the result of some very good work of folks on campus of retaining and progressing and graduating students better. So as those students have been retained longer than normal, they kept their scholarships, which created a substantial deficit. Hence, we got into a $4 million hole with that program. But this allocation of $4.1 million, I am proud to report, if adopted, would entirely close that gap. 
The next slide outlines uh, what our compensation pool would look like. I already shared with you that the governor included a 4% pool in his budget earlier this year, which was adopted last week by the General Assembly. That is only 55% funded, as I mentioned, and as to how that will be allocated. Uh, we've tried to focus as diligently as we could on a number of different things this year with the pool. The first being a raise of our campus minimum wage to $11.30 an hour. It currently sits at 1010. We'll continue to focus on this in the out years within the next few years, hoping to be right at that $14 to $15 market range. Uh, we'll also institute a new non-tenure track minimum uh, for those um, individuals that have a terminal degree, the minimum would be set at 45,000 and not a terminal degree, it would be set at $40,000. Tenure and promotions would continue as well as a professor here on campus is promoted from associate to full professor or assistant to associate, they receive a 10% increase. The University of Tennessee also adopted a new job family restructure, which was a significant and much welcome update uh, to the market ranges of a number of our staff positions. So we have made some adjustments uh, for individuals that were below the first quartile in staff compensation. We'll continue to be aggressive with those same compensation measures for staff in the new fiscal year as well. And then we are proposing a 2.75% market merit adjustment for all eligible employees effective July 1 for staff, August 1 for faculty. These slides I won't spend much time on at all, but you'll see here from a taxonomy standpoint how our revenue is broken out, uh, still sitting at about 30% state appropriation, uh, which is very much so welcome uh, addition from the state. On the expense side, everything academic sits right at about 50%. We're very pleased with that. Scholarships are at about 7%, auxiliaries at 10, and the other biggest bucket here is student services, which is a combination of Dr. Freeman's area, as well as athletics, which is right at about 13%. On the natural classification side, our salaries and benefits continue to be uh, the single biggest expenditure here on campus, uh, but we also have about 31% in operating as well. On the restricted side, which sits right at about a $65 million budget and also requires your approval, uh, 51 million of that is made up of grants and contracts with the biggest chunk of that being the Hope Scholarship uh, funded by the Tennessee Lottery and then other gifts and endowments being right at about $13.6 million. You'll see there on the expense uh, classification of that restricted budget, the scholarships and fee waivers make up right at about 76% of that in alignment with what I just said about um, the HOPE scholarship. The remainder of that is other grants and things happening on campus. This is the part that I, I won't spend much time on at all, but I wanted to point out one slide because uh, this is something we don't tell frequently enough, and that's what is our net price. We often advertise the sticker price, which for an in-state undergraduate would be right at about 9,800 this fiscal year if, if adopted. But you'll see here in the current fiscal year, for a student with a family income of $0 to $36,000, those students are often getting a refund on average of about $2,000. If the family income is between 36 and 85, they're paying about $1,200, and then it does go up gradually from there in the highest quartile on average of about $3,800. So our net price number still remains very competitive, which is something we'll continue to be aggressive at monitoring and uh, not just monitoring, but being sure it remains that way as well. The rest of these slides I won't spend any time on. You've seen them before. They're, they go over our fund balance, our debt, uh, what we've invested in compensation, uh, other square footage on campus, housing occupancy, we're running at about $135 million capital, uh, prior capital program right now. So that is strong. The governor's budget also includes three capital maintenance projects totaling about $11 million. So we are thankful for that. And then the UC Foundation continues to remain a tremendous partner to this campus with the total endowment value sitting at about 176 
million dollars, and they turn around and give about 5.6 million of that back to the campus every year. And we are very grateful for their support and, and all the work that many of you all do on that foundation. So with that, I will thank those on this slide. You can read that, but just acknowledging again, how many folks participated in this process. And I will also take any questions, Mr. Chair. Tyler. Yes, sir. Ricky Barker again. I want to congratulate you. I think this is your second report to this group and you're just, you're about to catch up with Richard. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> But 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 I have I have a dumb question. A dumb question. Six or seven slides back, the one entitled "Post uh, Proposed Undergraduate Tuition and Fees." I look at it and says, for, "See undergraduate students." Well, let, let me so, share my. I don't see anything for tuition. What is maintenance fees? Is that tuition plus something? The the, the maintenance fee is is the Tennessee term for in-state tuition. Well, I'd like to see that at the top. I'd say. For somebody like me, that that not very all right. Mandatory. What are what's included in mandatory fees? Mandatory fee is everything from a facilities fee, technology fee, oh, right. student activity okay. fee, and things like that. So, so maintenance fees is Tennessee's term for tuition. Yes, sir. And then out of state, yeah, out of state tuition in Tennessee is referred to as tuition. In state is referred to as maintenance. Okay. Well, I got it. That's a good suggestion, Judge. We'll certainly incorporate that in future years. Hey, Tyler. Take, it took, took me a while to figure that one out, too. So, um, Tyler, that's a tremendous amount of, of work, and I'm sure Richard Brown somewhere is sitting around smiling uh, because you, you've done an outstanding job along with the rest of your team. I mean, I uh, have worked on, on budgets not quite that size, and it's a tremendous undertaking. Um, not, any other I, questions? I don't what, what was the average? I got what is a block grant? That, that's a good How question. What was the average block grant? That is a good question, uh, Fred. The, the average I'm just is wondering what my tax dollars are going for. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I'm, uh, it's I'm wondering when you're on a full scholarship and you get a block grant, it, is that kind of just free money? It is. The block grants were based on Pell eligibility, and they averaged about $2,000 per block grant. No wonder we can't get any employees. To do. Never mind. I'm sorry to get political here. Oh, money. Money yeah. for nothing. And I, I will say the, the one thing that we can do on HERF 3 that we could not do on HERF 1 and 2 is apply those block grants to outstanding student balances. The first two HERF rounds prohibited that, but I do think that will help us on the third round when we can allocate those funds. Okay. Any other uh, questions? Uh, surely we've got something for uh, Tyler after all that work. Sure, sorry for the rant. No, no, that's... Uh, we're here to advise. Uh, sometimes it sounds like a rant. That's okay. Um, well, part of our official duty is to uh, pass on the budget and recommend it and approve that we pass it on to the board, uh, the full board of trustees that meets in June. Um, any other questions or comments? If not, I will ask for a motion. You know, the two percent increase, and I've talked to the chancellor about this. I, you know, it's it's long overdue. Uh, if you just don't look at anything, you know, except inflation over the last three years, inflation, while very low, has exceeded uh, two percent uh, over the course of, of three years. So, you know, we're, we're we're probably not even catching up with inflation by doing a two percent increase. Uh, I don't think there's been an uh, increase in the. Hope scholarship allocation in a couple of years. So it's long overdue and the money is as well spent. As you can see, most of it going to uh, students and, and faculty. So those are my only comments. Mr. Chairman, if I may make one comment on the one page document that you all are required to approve and, and was in your packet, yes. it is possible that there could be a minor adjustment to that after your approval because 
this process does not align with the UT systems budget development process. Don't ask me why, but that is how it goes. So it is possible if they ask us to make an entry, those numbers could change, but we would alert you of that at your next meeting. It would be very immaterial if that occurs. Right, and absolutely. This is just a budget recommendation. It is not a final approval that would come from the Board of Trustees. And there could be adjustments between now and June. I think, I think most of us recognize that. But thank you for, for clarifying that. Yes, um, Angle, do you know if, uh, how, what is President Boyd's recommendation for instruction on what we can increase? I think he, he is um, going, he'd like it to be as low as possible, but understands why we're at 2%. Um, I think the Tennessee Higher Education Commission has yet to issue a final firm guideline. Uh, they're probably going to be zero to three percent, we think. Um, so, um, you know, we're we're actively looking at enrolling students for the next semester this coming fall, where these new fees are going to be used. So, um, we're operating with the best information we have and have developed the budget accordingly. Yeah. At, at some time we have to give somebody a price that we think is gonna be the price come fall. Okay, any other uh, comments? If not, uh, do I have a motion uh, and a second to approve the operating uh, budget recommendations? I move so to approve it. Judge Barker, the second? I'll second. Okay, Jamie, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we will need a roll call vote. Uh, Secretary Steele. Judge Parker. Yes, vote for it. Mr. DeCosimo. For it. Ms. Desai. Yes, for. Professor Harvey. Yes. Ms. Hoffman. Yes. Chairman Leroy. Yes. The motion passes. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. I know that was uh, a lot of information in a short amount of time, but uh, it's an amazing job to condense it down uh, to to what we uh, had the short view of it today. Thank you, um, Billy. And thank you again, uh, Tyler. It was a great job. Uh, that concludes uh, our formal agenda. Um, do we have any other items that we need to bring up or discuss uh, at this meeting? Um, Chancellor, I know, I think you had a few maybe final comments. Yeah, if any of the board has comments we, or th issues they'd like to raise, um, we're interested. Any? Okay, well, I wanna thank everybody for their time. Uh, Certainly a lot of work went into preparing uh, the, the presentations. The budget is an incredible amount of work. And um, I uh, appreciate, you know, his big shoes to fill that Richard Brown had and uh, Tyler's done a great job and we appreciate that. Um, we will continue to try to be good stewards of the funding that we get from the state of Tennessee and from our students with tuition. Um, and uh, I, you know, the, the 2% is something that we think we can maintain the quality of our programs, um, fulfill the 4% uh, salary pool that the governor had where we can provide our share of that funding and uh, still be affordable. So we'll continue to set scholarships as a very high priority. Uh, approaching affordability. And in the numbers that uh, Tyler presented in terms of the actual out-of-pocket cost based on income, you know, that uh, UT promise where $50,000 or less of, of uh, effective family income, that we are providing a last dollar scholarship for those students. So, that $50,000 is something we're certainly gonna look at with our new strategic plan and what are our goals to try and increase affordability. 
I uh, can assure you all we will um, continue to push there. So thank you so much. I appreciate um, both our uh, Chair Leroy and uh, Mr. DeCosimo for participating in the Strategic Planning Committee. So uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, one final note, uh, our next meeting is uh, scheduled for October 4th at 3 p.m. Uh, always subject to change, but uh, for those of you who do not have it on your calendar, please go ahead and get it on there and there'll be additional updates uh, between now and then. I believe that concludes our business uh, for today. And I really truly appreciate everybody joining in today. Uh, and, and participating and uh, advising, which is what we are supposed to do. Uh, with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Somebody. I'll give a motion. Okay, Carol, thank you. And a second. Tony Harvey, second. All right, great. The motion and a second. Uh, roll call, David. Judge Parker. He's muted, but I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. DeCosmo. Yes. Ms. Desai. Yes. Professor Harvey. Yes. Ms. Hoffman. Yes. Chairman Leroy. Yes. The motion carries. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Bye. summer. Bye.